Dear audience, welcome to the show Power Chat through this special episode, 140th episode. We are presenting you today with uh, the issues and insights on distance and digital learning. Joining us today, three distinguished uh, guests, uh, Dr. Sabnam Koirala Ajat, Dean of the School of Education and also a professor of international multicultural education at the University of San Francisco. Also, we are joined today by Dr. Gangaram Gautam, a professor of English language, also the director uh, of the Open and Distance Education Center at Tribune University. We are also joined today by Mr. Pushkar Shrestha, country director of uh, Room to Read Nepal. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, each one of you. Welcome to the show, uh, all of you. Welcome to uh, the show Power Chat. We are presenting this show to uh, Nepali audience for last three years, uh, mostly focusing on issues of development, education and diplomacy. And through this episode today, we are discussing on uh, ways overcoming educational uh, challenges and uh, uh, reaching out to the public through distance and digital learning. I'm starting with a very general uh, question. Uh, from uh, Professor Ganga uh, Ram Gautam. How are you reaching out to uh, your students at the time of uh, pandemic? Um, Lakshmanji, thank you very much for inviting me to this wonderful show with such a distinguished uh, group of uh, panelists. Um, in Tiruvan University, um, I can talk about my university at the moment and maybe later we can go beyond that. Uh, in Tiruvuman University, initially we thought that this COVID-19 would be a short-term thing. So we just uh, wanted to wait and see how it goes. Uh, when uh, the first week passed by, we realized that this is something which is very uh, serious and uh, this is long-term and this is unpredictable. So we started thinking about how we can um, establish communication between students and teachers um, uh, through the classes that were abruptly you know, disturbed by COVID-19 attack. So Tiruvan University um, took uh, a few steps in this regard, and then immediately we started um, you know, planning how we can uh, respond to COVID-19 uh, by uh, switching the face-to-face -face mode of education into online. But it was a Herculean task. It was a big task, and it was not easy to do uh, at a time when the country was in complete lockdown. So uh, I will share with you very briefly uh, uh, the key steps that we have taken. So what we did was um, we immediately contacted uh, Microsoft Office and uh, we created a virtual Tirubhuvan University um, the first uh, few week of um, this COVID-19 attack and uh, created the classroom um, in the virtual world. And then we um, trained our teachers to um, um, teach their students uh, through online platform using Microsoft Teams. So that's the first thing we started in Tiruvuvan University and we are still working on that. Uh, you already know that Tiruvuvan University is very large university with the coverage all over the country. Uh, so we are still reaching out to some of them, but uh, most of the classes have now gone online using that Microsoft Teams software, and we have been training the teachers for the last few months. Um, and the second thing I think I must share with you uh, at this moment is, we also use this COVID-19 attack as an opportunity to integrate information and communication uh, technology in the TU's educational program. So in the second phase, we are currently planning how we can um, implement or embrace information and communication technology in higher education system, um, particularly in Thiruvan University's academic program by running some of our pro programs through blended mode. Since COVID-19 impact is not still uh, predictable, uh, we would like to run some of our program online and some of our programs face-to-face -face, um, and in a kind of blended mode so that we can reach out to the students who are willing to... Um, Dr. Gautam, uh, what is the response from your students? Are they receptive enough? Uh, any problem around uh, receiving uh, the way you teach through online or digital uh, platforms? Excellent question. Uh, mixed response. Some of the students are very excited 
and I was just talking to campus chief of some remotely located campus like Surkhet and um, other Terathom. Uh, in some campuses, the attendance is 100%. In some campuses, the attendance is 20%. So we have such a big range. So there is a mixed response. But what we have done is we talked to uh, the internet provider like Telecom and Encel, and then we have requested them for a subsidized package. So if the students are accessible uh, to the data package, the classes are going okay. If the students do not have access to those facilities, there is still a challenge. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Gautam. Uh, I want to go with uh, uh, Mr. Puskar Lal Sresto. You are leading room to uh, read activities here in Nepal. How are you reaching out to your stakeholders and how are you disseminating your interventions or activities? Uh, among uh, the vulnerable groups, especially that of the, uh, you know, school children, uh, girls and women, that of your own program interventions here in Nepal. Uh, thank you, Lakshmiji, for inviting me in this uh, program. Uh, glad to be here. Um, so, you know, just to give you a little glimpse of, uh, 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 in terms of what Room to Read does, Room to Read um, uh, as an organization actually started from Nepal, and, and we like to say that it's one of the it's one of the biggest export export that Nepal has ever done, sort of like a tangible in terms of education. So the programs were tested, and, uh, and, and, and programs were tested, and then it was expanded in other countries uh, beyond Nepal. We currently work in more than 16 countries. Uh, we started in 2000, 2000 here. Uh, so, so post-COVID, you know, we, we were reaching out to many schools and about like more than more than 8,000 girls and also um, also about uh, 500 schools at a time. But uh, now after COVID, you know, after COVID, we've, we've done a lot of homework at our end and we we worked on how can we start, how can we, how can we reach out, how can we reach out to the students, most vulnerable communities that we currently work in, how can we go about doing it? So we looked around, we checked. We checked the technology, we, we, we checked the social media, we, we checked a lot of different things. And ultimately, what we came down to is that uh, the currently we work in about 15 districts of Nepal, and we came down to the conclusion that technology is very difficult in the areas that we work in. They don't have access to technology. So we started off with radio programs. So we have been reaching out to um, more than 500 schools and more than 4,000 girls in 15 districts of Nepal with currently heavily focusing in radio programs. 12 radio programs, 200,000 children that we've been able to reach out in more than seven districts currently. So situation, you know, as, as, as you would know, it's, it's, it's not that easy in terms of technology as I hear that um, to the data that only 9%, only 9% of uh, children have access to technology and internet in schools. So, and, and we work in such communities where that is even rare. So what we are doing right now is focusing on radio and also calling the parents. We are calling parents and teachers to using the phone and also using SMS messages through the phone. So we send about like 20,000 SMSs to the teachers and also to the parents. And also we reach out to about 500 parents a week and teachers. So the learning continues in the school. So well, uh, I will Mr. Uh, up, uh, uh, very interesting insights you're presenting with us uh, along mm -hmm. with the technological barriers you noticed. Any other uh, cultural or family uh, problems, you know, receiving your interventions on part of uh, the girls and women that you are reaching out very quickly. Of course, yes. So, I mean, economic situation, parents have lost a job, parents do not have money at home, it's difficult to feed, and that's when it comes down to girls at home, you know, we support girls who are from grade 6 to 12, so then they are put into work, they are put into work, household work, so we are very worried that girls who we are supporting and other girls might not end up coming back to the school post COVID when the situation gets normal. So situations are difficult, but then again, we are urging to parents, asking them, requesting them, creating an environment at home, however they can, so the learning continues at home. 
Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Sreshta. I'm now going with uh, Professor uh, Sabnam Koedala Azad. You are leading the School of Education at the University of San Francisco. You listened our two panelists uh, that there are problems reaching out to uh, the girls and women, and you are also a professor of multicultural education. How do you see uh, the diversity and inclusion issues, including that of the multi uh, multicultural setup uh, across the world or in, in your areas? And uh, how can uh, the digital learning, learning be more effective at, at the time of pandemic? Thank you so much, uh, Lakshmanji. And it's wonderful to be here with the panelists. It's uh, very inspiring to hear about the efforts of Room to Read as well as at Tribuan University. And as I was um, listening to you, I was thinking that you know, we might be geographically in different places, but the issues are very much the same. Um, and they may look different, but I think that, you know, this COVID-19 has been a global phenomenon that has done some interesting things across the globe. So on the one hand, I think it's made very clear um, that we're all affected everyone is affected regardless. And I think we saw it when the lockdowns happened here in San Francisco, same thing, you know, immediately within the course of a week, we had to figure out how we were going to shelter in place and uh, provide online education. So that realization that it was affecting all of us um, was clear. And at the same time, I think that this uh, coronavirus has just exposed some of the differences. Um, it has exposed ways in which the virus has affected different people in different ways. Um, and here in the United States, uh, we see it more in terms of race and socioeconomics. And in Nepal, we were just hearing from Pushkarji about the effect on a gender or caste level. So I think that these differences um, have become that much more apparent with COVID-19. And then the question becomes, of course, you know, we've been talking about a digital divide for a very long time. So for a long time, we've known that there exists a di digital divide. But I think when it came down to having to figure out how to teach all these students in schools across the country, across you know different contexts, that's when we really realize that you know how this digital divide really takes hold in in communities. And so uh, you know you asked the question about how do we really think about ways in which to um, kind of narrow this gap? And, and as we see this, coronavirus timeline extending, how do we actually address the issue of these, you know, differences and the gaps? So I, I do think some of the examples that have been provided, um, I was very inspired to hear about Pushkarji's, um, you know, the room to read effort to go uh, to do radio programs instead of really expecting everyone to have online access. Um, and I think in similar ways, this is the time, um, on the one hand, we all moved in a crisis mode to think about what are the ways in which we can continue to provide education. And on the other hand, this is the time for us to imagine new ways in which we can provide education, but maybe it's not even education in that traditional sense. What is it that uh, children, youth, communities need at this time in terms of raising consciousness and being engaged and you know continuing their um, continuing to nurture their uh, search for knowledge rather than trying to replicate exactly what we do in schools and in classrooms but on an online format and so I think paying attention to that is going to be um, really important well, um, uh, Professor uh, Querella, do you suggest for uh, some common framework of the multicultural digital literacy? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's going to be hard to find a common framework. 
I think the common framework has to be a framework of recognizing this moment and the fact that the impact of the coronavirus and the impact of digital learning and online education is very different for different people, um, you know, specific to their situation. And so I think that if we don't acknowledge that, we're going to be in trouble. We're going to continue to widen the divide. So I think the, the, the first step is just to acknowledge that this moment affects people in different ways. And therefore, when we talk about online education and digital learning, we have to uh, provide that in ways that meet the needs of specific populations. And right. again, that's why this example of the radio program versus an online program um, is, is, I think, a really important one. Well, uh, thank you, Professor Quarella, for your uh, opening insights. I will come back to you with more questions. I'm going with uh, Dr. Uh, Gautam. Uh, how can the digital literacy among academics uh, be promoted here in Nepal? You have been into uh, the university for a long time. And uh, how can the gap that Professor uh, Quarella was mentioning, that of the digital uh, gap, uh, be fulfilled here in Nepal? Yeah, yeah. I think this is a very important issue, uh, particularly in Tiruvun University context, where we have uh, in constitution um, campuses alone, we have about 9,000 teachers with uh, different uh, digital uh, competence. Some of our faculty members are very proficient in digital uh, literacy. Some of them still don't have email address. So you can imagine how the digital literacy is um, and the, the kind of range, wide range among the staff. So it's been a challenge. So our approach that we have taken is do not overwhelm with the fancy digital tool right at the beginning of the program. Start with something that they, they, are, they are familiar with. So, uh, so that's the approach we have taken at the moment. And also, um, if the and also uh, as Professor Koirala mentioned, uh, when you say teaching through using digital uh, tools, it is not just delivering lecture. It's more of bringing the pedagogy. So the online pedagogy is a whole lot of you know issue that we need to consider when you switch from face-to-face -face mode of education to online mode of education. Um, in the face-to-face -face classroom, there are a lot of social, you know, environment where students interact with their friends, with their teachers. There are lots of things going on which you cannot replace by this uh, online mode of education. So, so that's a big challenge. So, in Thiruvan University, what we have done is we have started with a very simple tool, like um, I mentioned, Microsoft um, Teams, and. We are training our teacher gradually how they can integrate the other learning management system into the kind of virtual class they are delivering. So we are taking step by step approach. But as I mentioned earlier, it's a big, big, big challenge. And then we can build on the strength that we develop and then we can overcome the challenges that we face ahead. As we, well, uh, as we Dr. Gautam, uh, you said that you are uh, trying to, you know, fulfill this digital gap, but, uh, you know, capacity building of teachers and academics or students will take time. What are yes. other alternative ways, you know, reaching out to uh, these students in schools and universities here Very in good. Nepal? Uh, uh, Mr. Sresta was uh, mentioning about the media mobilization, radio and uh, TV yeah. pro uh, programming. How can the other ways of distance learning, including that of uh, the uh, radio or TV programming, uh, be made more effective very quickly? Right. We can, um, there are many options, but we need to work on those things. So in order to do that, I think that's where the university comes in. University has to start researching the various models to reach out to different group of students. University alone maybe cannot do that, but we have to build an alliance among the like-minded people and organizations, like the developing partners like Room to Read, the government, Ministry of Education. So by building an alliance of those working in the same space, I think we need to create model 
that works within the constraints in the local realities. I think that's how we need to move on. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Gautam. Uh, Mr. Puskarlal Sresta uh, uh, is here from the room to read. Uh, could you tell us uh, the uh, your ways of you know uh, digital mentoring uh, for the vulnerable groups? You you uh, slightly mentioned about uh, you know your ways reaching out to the girls and women in remote uh, parts of Nepal. How do you mentor them, Mr. Sesta? Right, thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, Lakshmi. So, what we are doing currently, you know, so as I said earlier, uh, digitally uh, we are very divided. We, the, we we cannot have access. We cannot have access in the communities that we currently operate in uh, and work in. So, what we are doing is we are reaching out through telephone. We're reaching out through phones and calling the parents and asking if they are giving enough spaces, enough spaces in the homes and and. So the learning continues. So the so the reading continues at home for the little children. So we 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 work in primary grades, grade one through five, to to sort of build reading skills and reading habit of children. And on the other hand, we work with the girls from grade six to twelve, right, adolescent girls. So what we are doing is we're reaching out and asking the parents, please provide some time, give some spaces so through our phone calls you know through our phone calls what we have found out is by reaching out to uh, 2000 children uh, calling the parents and reaching out the children they are actually providing 2.53 hours two and a half hours of time every day to children for reading and learning purposes so it hasn't been easy you know it hasn't been easy because then again, when you call the parents, they sometimes feel in a different way that, you know, why we are calling, you know, continuously calling them. So, but, but we haven't stopped. We, have, we keep on calling them to ask that. So we have a radio program, right? So we have a radio program. So the radio program, we wanna, so radio program is a one-way program. As, as uh, Dr. Ganga was mentioning earlier, it, it's a, so, so there's no interaction, you know, schools, where we where we go for learning, there's interaction, there's human connectivity, there's human touch. There. So we lack that. So what we do is we call them up and ask them that if they are providing enough time for the children, so the learning happens. So we are very happy that. But this is only a tiny bit. Two thousand children, two thousand parents that we have called. We are happy. It makes us happy. It, 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 it's an encouraging fact that at more than two and a half hours of learning activities actually happening so with this and another thing that we've been doing is mentoring you know mentoring especially the girls adolescent girls that if if they have enough time at home are they safe at home because you know um eight hours a day they're in school but rather than that they are home always so they're so we, we want to make sure that the parents understand that the girls when they reach certain age they need certain spaces you know so at the time of menstruation and all that so they need spaces at home so we mentor the girls we talk to the parents and ensure that they are given spaces and time so the learning continues and if they have you know we have uh, social mobilizers you know we have social mobilizers calling them and they're they're even maintaining social distances maintaining social distances they even go and visit some of the houses if they if we see that there's certain risks are happening and, and, and very very sad to inform that you know 15 girls that it, within our support of programs are more than 4,000 girls that we're supporting with the girls education program 15 girls have gotten married in this time and 15 girls could have been and they might not, never come back to school so so then again so that's just a small chunk out of 4,000 but then again it worries us so we we partner with the local government and, and the central government make sure that these things are being taken seriously by the government and we partner with them we go visit to the communities along with the local government representatives and make sure that they also understand and it sustains the effort that we're making sustains well uh, mr like, sesta uh, with the schools and um, universities uh, you know, uh, they went with uh, the digital uh, learning, you know, uh, system these days. And but there are criticisms from uh, some family uh, 
uh, that there is no appropriate access. You are talking about the radio programming. How um, often do you uh, take care of uh, the you know diversity setup, including that of the uh, languages and you know culture uh, cultural setups in our society? And what uh, particular uh, measures should be taken to you know uh, minimize uh, the linguistic and cultural barriers in digital learning, Mr. Sester? Thank you. So, I mean, it's, it's a very good question. So, currently, we, we are running all our programs in Nepali, uh, thinking that the Nepali is understood by everyone in the villages and the communities, but it is a challenge. You know, some of the parents might not uh, have good comprehension skills in terms of understanding Nepali in the community, but we are working around it in terms of, you know, we publish books. We publish books and we have uh, more than three nearly 400 books that we have published in Nepali and some of the books are in the different languages as well. Yeah, we are working on these barriers, but uh, in, at the same time with the radio programs, along with that, we also started a digital platform called literacy.org where we have published more than 100 books in Nepali language and there are more than 1,000 books in different languages that's accessible uh, to the population and to the children who have access to technology so we are doing that part on the side as well, but we understand we understand the uh, difficulties and, and 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 situation around it. So, but the good part around it is that government uh, of Nepal has come up with alternative education guidance 2077, which sort of categorizes five different category of accessibility. You know, like children having no technology, no radio, nothing. One category. And leading up to category five, where children have access to technology. So we are working around with the government at central level and provincial and local level to figure out solutions. If this continues, if if this academic session, if we lose this academic session, what do we do? So we are working out to print out workbooks. We're thinking about going out to communities and giving and uh, these workbooks so the vulnerable communities do have access to writing. You know, so we are working these things out. As, as I said, it's not, it hasn't been bit easy, but you know, so these are challenges, but then we are working along with the local government to make sure that capacity strengthening happens at that end. So then it sustains, so that effort sustains. At the end of the day, the difficulties that we are running out due to the COVID is, will need to be handled by the government at the end of the day. As Dr. Ganga was pointing out, he's also, trying to partner with the government at the central and the local level to take this thing forward. So yes, it's difficult, but then again, we are working out to sort of collectively uh, uh, handle this along with the with the local government and the municipalities and the education sector of the municipality. Well, Mr. Sester, really interesting insights. Let's listen, uh, Professor Koirala. Professor Koirala, how can... Uh, we ensure easy access to digital resources and digital platforms uh, provided that you know there is diversity in uh, nepali or underdeveloped uh, uh, you know societies uh, how can we ensure that the digital resources are reaching out to the vulnerable groups uh, with uh, safety safety that of you know digital safety literacy uh, linguistic or uh, you know other barriers in our society that is a big question and I think a big dilemma um, because, uh, you know, there are so many uh, wonderful resources available uh, for digital learning. I've seen some examples of things being used at, you know, the primary level, the secondary level. There are some really wonderful resources, but again, those resources are available to those who have access to it, who can afford it, and so on. So, you know, what was being discussed earlier, which is that the government needs to partner with people who are doing good work. And I think this is that moment when the resources exist. Um, so there are two questions. One is, what are the most relevant and useful resources to the various populations we're talking about? And I think of, you know, Gangaji and Puskarji as people who are in that position to be able to say what the most relevant and useful resources are. Um, but then the second question is then how are 
resources at the national level, at the government level being allocated to then allow for these materials or these digital platforms to be available. So, you know, from what I see here as well, the big issue right now is for the private sector, the public sector, for the government to really recognize that this is an unprecedented moment and that the only way we are going to um, address the challenges is to, first of all, partner together, uh, to work together. And then the second thing is really to listen to those people who are doing the work on the ground <laughs> because they are the ones that best know the realities of uh, different groups of people, you know, children, youth, um, what the needs are, what will work, what will not work. Um, and then for those in, uh, you know, uh, capacity of power who have control over resources, then to listen and then to channel those resources to those areas of need. Um, and then the private sector as well. The private sector is often the sector with access to more resources. So instead of really thinking about, um, you know, resources in private sector resources as being confined to the private sector, this might be the time to partner with pub the public sector in order to then make those resources, to really share those resources as well. So um, I have thought about this a lot uh, in the context of the United States and even here in San Francisco as we think about how can the university partner with the school district and how can the school district partner with the uh, local government uh, I think it's the same thing. I think this is the moment that's calling for us to just be in deeper collaboration than we ever have, because the solutions are not going to come from one place. Um, and the, the, the resources are there. <laughs> They're wonderful resources. Well, uh, Professor Querela, you uh, said that uh, private partnership uh, is very important. Any specific learning from your uh, university uh, after uh, uh, the pandemic uh, started uh, that you want to share with us that can be applied uh, here, here in Nepal as well, especially that of the digital learning uh, exercise? Yes, I think um, more than the university, one of the things that we found out in the state of California, which as you all know, is one of the states with the most resources, financial and otherwise, technologically, um, when the pandemic happened, we realized that even in urban school districts in California, one in five children did not have access to digital technologies, whether it was internet access or a laptop or a, or a tablet or whatever they needed to be able to participate in schools. And so um, at that moment, what we saw was many of these technology companies that are here, the big technology companies, started to, you know, actually address this problem. Um, the issues and these companies have already existed together here, but it was COVID and the exposure of this divide that then led these companies to say, oh, you know, maybe we have a role to play here. Um, and so those are the instances, I think. I, again, you know, we are in this very unprecedented moment. And so, um, like I said earlier, I think the solutions are going to have to be unprecedented as well. And so that, those are some ways in which I saw that happening here. And then again, in terms of uh, very similar to what Gangaji was saying, uh, you know, in Tribune University, we also at the University of San Francisco in March immediately went into crisis mode. We, have to, we had to take all our on-ground classes and figure out how to put them online. And I think that now that we made it through the semester, we took some time to really evaluate, you know, what worked, what didn't work, how should we do this differently as we think about going into the next semester. And I think that there's a lot of room for creativity as well. Um, and hopefully this is a time when we're open to creativity as well, um, that to really think about, you know, evaluating our learnings and to doing things differently. 
because you know one thing is for sure um, none of us has experienced a time like this before and so if we don't approach this from a mode of learning that you know we do certain things and then we learn and we evaluate um, I think it's going to be very difficult if we get stuck well, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Guadella. I'm going with uh, Dr. Uh, Gautam. Uh, is there any assessment on uh, the digital uh, capabilities or access and use uh, in the academic, uh, you know, teaching, learning uh, practices here in Nepal? Uh, is there any assessment and are you considering to go with an assessment because, you know, uh, at the end of the day, uh, the access matters. Access. Uh, uh, linking to different uh, diversities and challenges uh, in our societal setup. Uh, Dr. Gautam. Um, yes, I think there are so many options that we can explore. Um, uh, one of them could be uh, partnering with the local government um, and utilize the local um, community learning centers through the local government ward offices. So in the current uh, political setup, every ward office is more or less equipped with certain digital devices. If we can expand that with the support of the local government, federal government, NRN, development partner, and utilize those spaces for digital learning, for creating digital literacy among the community. And another example, we have uh, thousands of cooperatives all over the country, even in the remote areas of Nepal. And most, most of these cooperatives are led by women. And they need some kind of capacity building. And these women know uh, the learning needs of their children at this time of crisis. And they have some resources as well. So as um, Sabaramji said, and there are, there are people with creative ideas at the private sector. You know, the crisis leads into innovation. So this is the time we need to find and tap the resources available around. So if we can, um, you know, find those uh, ways and tap those resources, both human and non-human, the physical, the financial resources available around, I think there are plenty of ways we can, uh, we can address these issues. But one of the big issues uh, in our context, in my context, is we are not often proactive in Nepal. Because once this COVID-19 attacked, we all were thinking that it is a short term and it would go away in the next couple of weeks or months. So people in the leadership like us and people working in the government and people working in the academia, we need to be proactive enough to anticipate the problem and the severity of the issue that has attacked us. So if we have that kind of, uh, you know, approach, uh, we can come uh, with, with, uh, with the solutions that works on the ground. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Little bit, little bit, little bit generic, but that's how I see this. Yes. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Gautam. But I want to uh, put one more question uh, on you, Dr. Gautam. Uh, what about uh, the uh, real-time engagement in learning uh, environment, you know, uh, the access when you talk about uh, the social media or any other technological innovations here in Nepal, it's uh, gradually improving. But there is criticism that, uh, you know, uh, people are not seriously engaged in academic or learning exchanges. What That's you have right. to say on that, how can the culture of digital learning be improved? Right. Um, um, I think uh, the first issue that you talked about, uh, the access. So I think still uh, in uh, Thiruvu University, we don't have easy access for all the students. So what we are doing, we are encouraging our teachers to record their classes and then send the link and to their, to their students who do not, you know, um, attend their live or virtual classes, real-time virtual classes. Also, we have requested the teachers to develop the notes of the lectures that they deliver and develop a compendium and supply them to the students by email or printed, printed, printed uh, you know, ways. The second one, and the most important one that you have raised, um, how can we uh, improve the digital learning through these digital classes? So that's where the learning management system comes in. So what we have done in Trivon Universities, we, we are planning in the second phase once the 
face to face classes are switched into online mode and the teacher deliver lectures through virtual mode we are immediately giving them another round of training in which we will be talking about the pedagogy the engagement the communication the conversation the assessment so that the virtual classroom virtual engagement could be made more interactive and meaningful both for the learners and teachers well uh, thank you dr gautam i'm going with uh, mr uh, shreshta puskar uh, lal sister uh, could you tell us uh, the learning environment across your program interventions you heard uh, two other uh, panelists they were talking much on the resources and access and all uh, how do you analyze the uh, learning environment digital learning environment in nepal as such with the schools and learning centers across your program interventions and what are your key suggestions to the stakeholders ways improving uh, digital learning i was on mute sorry so thank you um lakshmi ji so see, see i think we'll have to go back in terms of um in terms of um, where were we you know before covid in terms of when we start to plan on this and give suggestions to the stakeholders to give suggestions to the stakeholders agreeing with dr shabnam and dr ganga so so i think i said this is or i feel um until the solutions are localized okay until the solutions are localized what i mean by that is i'll give you an example remember like 25 30 years ago we had the solar water heater okay and what happened it was expensive for 30 years but now you see it in every household if you you know most of the households that you go see so what happened what well, it was localized the technology was localized so we need to think in that sense and second of you know the the the, the second important aspect of that that i want to bring it up is how the maintenance part and how it was start being made locally in the villages in the small town so so the suggestion here is that how do we bring the businesses to get invested okay how how do we get business people to get invested how do government at all levels start thinking in a sense this is not going to go away so we need to start coming up with solutions which are localized okay so there diversity you know there are more than 114 languages spoken in the country so there a lot of lot of challenges but i see the situation has brought opportunity to us so how do we take care of that is something that we need to think of so what i see going forward is that technology is one part the other part is see the uh, other part is empowering the parents see the, the parents are spending tremendous amount of time with their children right now we are going back and asking them spend more time with them see what they are doing see how can you help with you know what can you help with i think this I and mean, i'm spending so much time with my children and i do spend that but i have that luxury of technology but the parents who do not have luxury of technology i think will will need to be told and and government is doing a wonderful job they come up they came up with a guidance it's just that we need to strengthen the stakeholders at the local level in the villages in villages in the communities that uh it in the part right and beyond in other countries as well so i speak for all education as well so then i think that the whole guidelines of alternative education taking it forward in a different categories and also partnering with at all level at dr shabnam uh, pointed out earlier bringing businesses on board seeing the opportunity getting involved with the parents and and also great idea in terms of involving um you know cooperatives which are practically run by uh, women in the villages so getting them involved in it i think the solutions will have to come locally in terms of how do we take this learning process forward and how can we uh, you know have education endure so that's that's sort of like the uh, partnership that we are also working on and i think it will have to be across uh, all the stakeholders and 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 it, it we we will get there but we will get there but then again uh it, as i said we were in a, a category of where we teach children how to read how to make them independent readers so so the interaction interaction between parents 
and and children is is a must for that to happen. So uh, I'll stop here for that and and and. And, and I'll take your next question. Well, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Sesta. I will come back to you. Uh, and I'm going with Professor uh, Koirala again. Uh, my question is on uh, the you know uh, issues of inclusion and diversity. Um, uh, how can uh, these issues be promoted within educational setup uh, and now in uh, the digital learning process, uh, Dr. Koirala? Thank you so much. Um, you know, I think it's been said in many different ways that um, it starts with an acknowledgement of the issues. <laughs> so lately I've seen a lot on uh, social media, young Nepalese youth writing more and more about caste, uh, you know, differences and their resources. I've seen digital resources about it. Um, it it's we have to acknowledge the issues, I think. That's a starting point. Um, I've seen over and over again that some of the issues that we see in education, some of the gaps that we see is because we continue to promote ideas that serve the most privileged. And that will always leave out those who have not been brought into the circle. And so I think it starts with that acknowledgement. and. Like it's been said, uh, the beauty of starting at the local level is that, you know, there's special attention to these very specific ways, these nuanced ways in which these divisions exist in the local setting. And, um, and so I think, I think we have to start there. Then, of course, um, you know, this question of resources is a big one. Um, the allocation of resources to those who are left out of opportunity, I think, is an important thing to consider as well. I think the problem has often been that the ideas exist in one place, the financial resources exist in another place, the policy ideas and the ability to build policy exist in another place. And when these actors are acting in, you know, with, uh, far away in distance from each other, then I think we see, uh, you know, we often see policies being built that are far removed from the realities of people's lives. Um, and similarly, in the same way. So I, I really think this is a moment to acknowledge some of these divisions that exist, and then to really start thinking about how do we actually bring these players together to address that. And I think that sort of inclusion um, is going to be a meaningful one because I think we can talk about inclusion in many ways. Um, but again, if people are left out of, you know, opportunities, then that's not inclusion. And then similarly, I think inclusion actually means listening to those who are most affected by an issue. Um, and I think oftentimes, again, the decision making and the solutions come from people who are not actually those who are affected by the issues. And so until we are able to do that, um, inclusion in its true form, I think, is not going to happen. Because we can't say, yes, we're working on, the beha on behalf of those who are left out, um, but I'm going to still do it my way <laughs> um, without really understanding and listening to those um, who haven't been heard over time. Do, do you, uh, Dr. Koerala, do you think that the context of information, especially that of the, you know, uh, mother tongue or the local context, the culture, are best conveyed through digital platforms these days? Or what are the ways improving it? Well, um, I haven't been in the Nepali context for a while, so I, feel, I don't feel like I can speak to that specifically. I think our other panelists might be in a better position to speak to that. But I do think that there's a way in which the digital form does have the ability to reach people in different ways. Um, I mean, we can take social media, for instance. Uh, you spoke earlier about, you know, how do we do media in a responsible way? And of course, there's a lot about social media that is detrimental, maybe, to young people. 
But we also see ways in which young people are using social media to raise consciousness, to be part of different movements, to align themselves with different ideas that are, you know, advanced and kind of forward looking and visionary even. Um, so in those ways, yes, I think that maybe those who traditionally didn't have a way to participate in those ideas and discourses and movement building opportunities have the opportunity to do that. And we especially see that among young people. Um, so there is, you know, there's a way in which the, these digital platforms, and I think we've seen that most right now in this context of COVID when we're all using digital platforms, um, we, we're seeing the promise of that. We're seeing how that can reach a variety of different people. But again, um, there are a set of values. <laughs> there are a set of um, kind of, uh, you know, ideas that have to drive that effort as well in order for it to be done in a productive way. Well, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Query. I'll carry forward this question to Dr. Gautam. Uh, Dr. Gautam, what is your insight on contextualizing the information uh, conveyed in the teaching learning process uh, in digital platforms? I think Sabanamji has very uh, nicely highlighted the role of local um, tools and resources. Uh, we have social media, we have local radio, FM radio stations all across the country. We have local television channel. These are very powerful in terms of communicating these messages of inclusion, digital literacy and several other issues that we have discussed uh, earlier. So if we can utilize these resources, I think that will be excellent. Like uh, if I share uh, an example. A uh, few weeks ago, one of my students, female students, complained that she's not uh, she's not given enough access to the digital tools for her classes because the other members in the family, including her husband and son and uh, other other friends, you know, uh, use it for their entertainment purpose. When it comes for the classroom purpose, learning purpose, still she is denied her rights to attend the classes using the digital tools which she already have as in her family right it's her it's her own family tool but still she has issues in having access to that particular tool so so i think we need a lot of uh, awareness raising campaign uh, and then social media and the local uh, digital uh, platforms are very important in this kind of uh, messaging uh, these kind of discriminations and uh, issues to the to the to the to the people uh, to the public at the local level so um, i think that's that's how we do it yes well uh, thank you dr gautam there are many interesting issues uh, coming in but we are coming to the end of the show but i have uh, one question uh, for each one of you before we wrap up this show uh, i'm going with uh, mr uh, uh, puska streshta uh, what should be done to strengthen digital uh, literacy among the vulnerable communities do you have any uh, key lesson learned from your uh, program initiatives here in nepal very quickly okay thank you so i think it's, it's a great question so we are working around it the question is that i think all of us will need to come together technology government development sector universities academicians i think everybody needs to come together to work out details in terms of how can we, so what are some of the challenges? How can the technology come to the villages? How would that happen? How, how, can, how can we take care of the safety and the security when the digital, you know, we, we take this, this digital process forward in the communities that, you know, most vulnerable communities. So all of the, these things will need to happen. But at the same time, I think parallelly, as I said earlier, we will need to focus in terms of the technology, such as radio and, and such, uh, any other means that the current the communities have access to. I think we should focus on that. We should reach out in this, uh, so, since we work with the schools directly, you know, so we, our suggestion is that, uh, you know, the learning should continue. Learning should not stop in any forms. Learning should continue. So when situation becomes better, you know, situation becomes semi-normal, then the kids come back to school, especially the adolescent girls, you know, so they come back to school and some sort of learning happens. And we're also discussing with the local level government that 
we need to have in terms of some sort of bridging course in the loss learning, you know, in the loss learning that happened. So then they come back, you know, we're talking about the children who, whose parents might not be literate, right? So they, they, they might not have been helped the way that we think. So then having some sort of course developed, it, so bridging course along partnering with the local government and the central government with the ministry and the department that you know, when the children come back, at least they are 50% ready in terms of learning, at least that I say. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Sesta. Uh, Professor Koirala, your uh, final insights on expanding uh, digital literacy, also uh, the ways promoting multicultural education in the digital setup. No, I always believe in building on strengths. And so I feel like there has been, there have been so many wonderful ideas and initiatives, especially in the context of Nepal. I uh, think about efforts to, uh, you know, democratize uh, mass media and communications, for instance. This, this conversation has made me think about, you know, my father's generation's efforts, his collaborators to think about the wall newspaper, for instance, in, in a rural setting, you know, how can you do that? So part of m my thinking is that how do we take some of those uh, lessons that we've learned, some, some of those wonderful initiatives to try and democratize information, try and democratize these things, and now think about moving those ideas into the, into the digital space. So what have we learned and how can we now think about this in terms of this this moment which is you know urging us into this digital space so um starting from a place of a recognition of what's worked really well in this context i think is is uh, a really good place to start and especially those initiatives that have that have been targeted for vulnerable populations and have been proven effective and how do we utilize some of those learnings to then translate it into this digital space? Well, thank you, uh, Professor Koyala. Uh, Dr. Gautam, your final thoughts very quickly on uh, ways promoting digital literacy in Nepal. Uh, yes, uh, I think leveraging the resources we have around, that's number one. Second, uh, reaching out to the vulnerable population in terms of higher education, UGC has already allocated certain amount of resources for that. Uh, in to respond to COVID-19 context. We need that and we need more of those kind, uh, kind of support. The third one, uh, I think partnering and persuading the local government to reach out to the vulnerable population, uh, partnering with the local academic and developmental partners, uh, academic institutions like university campuses, development partners like Puskarji already mentioned, uh, NGOs and INGOs working on the ground. So if we collectively build that kind of alliance and approach uh, collectively, we can we can reach out to the vulnerable population. Well, thank you, Sooner Dr. Uh, Gautam. Uh, I would like to thank each one of you, uh, Dr. Uh, Sabnam Koirala Ajad, uh, who is the Dean of School of Education, also the Professor uh, in International Multicultural Education, University of San Francisco in the United States. We would like to thank Dr. Gangaram Gautam, uh, Director of the Open and Distance Education Center, and Mr. Pushkar Lal Sresta, Country Director of the Room to Read uh, in Nepal. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for joining us. Dear audience, time now to wrap up the show. Keep watching us. See you next week. Namaste.